Hi there, folks. I was just waiting till all the doorbell sounds stopped. I hope you can hear me. It's Aidan McMichael. And everybody's really welcome tonight. And we've got a, can you say, a full house online, a full room or a full Zoom. Um, so thank you so much for coming tonight. You maybe saw the little advisory that we're being recorded. We, we normally record. The meeting is made available to folks afterwards on our private YouTube channel. And we'll be making that available to our guests tonight as well. So um, can we do some introductions? And I thought it would be really nice when we're doing our introductions to um, invite our guests and our speakers to um, join with us their recollections, I suppose, of not only how they got interested in the Titanic story, but what took it to the next level. Uh, in terms of their prominence as, you know, historians in this area and also writers. So, um, Bill, could we start with you? Because you've got this prominent Titanic uh, behind you. So uh, everybody's eye will immediately be drawn to that. So how did you, first of all, start off as um, someone maybe who didn't have an interest and suddenly it did? So what was that spark? Well, when I was growing up, uh, my mom always had the TV on. And in the late 50s, early 60s, they would occasionally rerun the movies A Night to Remember or the 1953 Titanic. And I'm going, oh, cool, a sinking ship. This looks good. Um, and I think it was must have been like 1963. I discovered the book A Night to Remember in the school library, and I thought it was just great. And then for a very long time there was nothing there were no new books there was not much going on um i did join um the titanic historical society in 88 um i went to one of their conventions on the queen mary in 95 and while i was there i discovered there was a uh, internet community of titanic people and i joined that and very soon after that i met george behe and tad fitch and uh, after a while, Tad and George and I were working on an article about the lifeboat lowering. And that turned into books. And I met, you know, then we met uh, Kent. And just one thing led to another. Great. Hello, Bill. You have to admit, in the retelling of that, it does sound as if you just took it to the next level, as if it was so easy. And it was just a matter of meeting a few people. And then suddenly I... I'm in there. So that gives us all joining this meeting tonight some hope because, you know, we're meeting these three eminent folks that are going to chat to us tonight. So maybe some of the folks on the call could also take it to the next level. And maybe we should talk about that later about, you know, if people have specific interests, how people do take it further. Um, Tad, from your perspective, you did get a mention a few times there. Yes, and um, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see so many yep. uh, individuals interested in history. But um, I, I've always been interested in history in general. It's something that I I shared uh, with my father in a lot of ways. And um, it was kind of mundane the way I got interested in Titanic. I was on vacation in Virginia Beach when I was very young. And there was a seafood restaurant that had a model of the Lusitania and Titanic in the restaurant. And being a little kid, I, of course, was interested in that and asked my dad, and he told me the story. And when he said they sank in the Atlantic, it's kind of funny from a little kid's perspective. I thought he meant right off the shore. So I was like, oh, great, they're right off the beach. Um, but what ended up happening shortly after that was when Ballard found and his uh, French expedition combined found the the wreck. Um, I got fascinated. And really what happened is I read every single book I could find on the subject through the libraries and um, there was a lot of questions that I had that were not answered in those books and I couldn't find an answer to. Um, so really what ha ended up happening is I spent a lot of time going through newspaper archives and microfilm, the old microfilm before digital where you're scanning it and getting seasick, watching the screen go by and, and all of that. And really when internet started becoming big, like Bill had mentioned, I, I was working on some things and found out about the online community and then, um, found out there was a lot of people that were asking similar questions and we combined our efforts. So it started out just sharing information and becoming friends with people. And then it became in some of these grand scale research projects and books. And um, 
became far more than I ever envisioned it becoming when I started, but um, started with a small interest and build up over time into something much larger. Yeah, and isn't it true, therefore, that as a proper researcher, you can't claim that title until you've done your microfiche and your microfilm? <laughs> I do remember it screeching through the, the, the film on the glass. It, it, it's not good. So, Kent, <laughs> so let's hear from you. Hello, everyone. Um, it is uh, it's an honor to be with you tonight. Um, thank you for inviting all of us to join you. Um, so my interest in Titanic started probably as early as I can remember. My father was very keen on the story. And when I came onto the scene, um, one of the first films that I was taken to as a baby, I'm told that I didn't behave myself. Uh, I was raised to Titanic. It was in theaters. Um, and of course, when it came to VHS, that was one of my prime things. I wanted to rent the movie every time we went to the video store. Drove my parents nuts. Um, there was also another movie from the year before. It was called SOS Titanic. And in the United States, we had, I didn't know there were two versions of it at the time. We had a long version of it in the States that I had picked up as a kid and uh, loved that movie. I was also a voracious reader at a very young age, and my dad had a copy of Walter Lord's A Night to Remember. It was the 76 edition that had the pictures in it, and uh, I still have that copy, uh, well tattered, basically falling apart at the bindings. Um, and then he really sealed the deal on my interest in the subject when I was about four. He came home with a scale model of the Titanic in the box. It was about, you know, it's the one three fifty scale model of, to a four year old. It might as well be the Titanic. And uh, we spent a lot of time working on that model together. And uh, so a childhood obsession, uh, fascination uh, turned into when I was in my late teens. Um, I started to get a lot more serious about it. I started to see one of the things that Tad mentioned is that a lot of the information, the books that were available contradicted each other. And so you'd, you'd pull one book out and you'd say, okay, well, that's interesting. I don't know where they got that. And then you look at the other book and you, you'd say, well, the two can't both be right. There has to be some, you know, some fact behind it. And so that led to me doing what Tad did. Um, going to the original source material, scanning through the microfilms, of course, um, but also, uh, like Tad, meeting a lot of people in the online community um, and beginning to share resources with them. Uh, a wonderful influence over the years, probably almost 20 years now, uh, he's with us tonight, or he was, is Mark Chernside, one of the best researchers I have ever had the privilege of knowing, um, and someone who... He looks at the reference material and he can analyze the data um, and put it in context. And so we've worked with Mark for many years. Um, we also know Gunter. I hope I'm saying your, your name correctly. Um, yes, uh, check is in the post. Wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll be sure to cash it as soon as it comes in, Mark. Um, so in more recent years, Gunter has uh, shared a lot of material with us. And Tad and Bill and I, we were, were very interested in getting back to original source material. And it's led us to slay a lot of dragons, uh, lay a lot of myths to rest um, that have propped up over the years from people basically copying off of each other's mistakes. So it's been a it's been a wild ride. Yeah, and I know that you haven't, you know, really also expanded to those other interests, you know, Carpathia, Lusitania and the other historic ships that we're familiar with. Um, one thing I must do, and I know we've got our um, probably the highest number of people we've had for a long time in the room and uh, sort of alluded to it earlier about everybody being really welcome. But I just wanted to make sure because people do drop off the call. So our guest tonight to really thank you on behalf of everybody that's here tonight. On, uh, on behalf of the Belfast Titanic Society, we're really grateful to your presence because you're, you're already adding to you know, the understanding of how people are interested in the Titanic and how they're taking it forward. But 
in discussion with you guys that we've agreed. Um, we went out to look for you know some questions and we've got those, but that the meeting will really take the form of uh, a discussion, a chat, um, a steered chat through some of those questions. So what we can do is use the chat facility online to maybe allude to the fact that you've got a question or certainly a comment. Um, and, you know, maybe there'll be other checks in the post, Mark, um, to others when they get a mention um, later. But certainly folks start to think about using this opportunity to um, put in a question or a comment. Um, and I just thank for the contribution um, thus far. So one version of the truth, we heard that. Telling the story through original research, so we've heard that as well. And then the the usefulness of the online community and um, joining together on, on all of that. And then the outcome of that is the slaying the dragons. Um, so some useful tips just to, to get us started. Started. So look, should we go straight into some of the the questions then? And maybe the once you hear that there's a few people have asked questions in advance, maybe others will come forward. Is that okay with the approach? Okay. So um, just starting off, just with some of the notes that I have, it's because it happened to be the shortest one. So James, um, James Gibbons, you're online, and maybe we can just take the question directly from you. So... While you look for your unmute button, I will give the question. So you're you're actually got straight into the technical question. Yes. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Now I I found it. Um. Yeah. The uh, question is regarding the propeller issue, the three prop and four prop, or uh, four pro, uh, four blade propeller versus the three blade and the switch with the Olympic during uh, its um, repair. And uh, I'm just wondering, with the scans that have recently been done on the Titanic, have you heard any any uh, reports that would indicate one or the other, like that would solidly, you know, definitively say whether it was a three prop or four prop? And I ask this as a model maker, of course, I've always put the four prop on my models. And uh, I am a little skeptical about the three bladed prop, but uh, let's hear from some experts. Can, can, it is can a I good take, question. Yeah. Can can I take the first part of that, and you can you guys can take the second. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a good question, James. And and one of those things it's we always see the images from the Olympic uh, from later later after the the sinking where it was four bladed and and people extrapolate that to to Titanic. But in regards to the scans themselves, that that uh, center turbine prop is so deeply embedded below the surface on the wreck. You can see see the starboard and port wing props above the mud line, but there there isn't anything they, with the technology they were using for the the phenomenal scans that they just released and are slowly releasing images from that would show that. Uh, so unfortunately, from that standpoint, that isn't something that can solve that question. But uh, as I'm sure Bill and and Kent can allude to, there there's a lot of documentation. Um, from archival and, and, and Mark Turnside is the foremost authority on this, I would say, but um, I'll turn it over to you guys for, if you want to kind of follow up on that and what we can learn from the existing documentation. Yeah. The uh, interesting thing about the controversy about three blade versus four blade is I think um over the years, trying to trying to frame it diplomatically, um, the very idea that Titanic had a four bladed center prop. It's something that people are emotionally attached to, because, again, you know, all the models that they've built, um, all of the movies that they've seen, what did Titanic always have? It always had a four bladed prop. But that was actually a conclusion that was based on an assumption. Um there actually were no photographs of Titanic center prop, uh, nothing that was available back in the day. Uh, and so many Olympic photos were tagged as Titanic photos um, from people who just didn't know the difference that it was kind of understandable to, you know, 
to make that assumption to say, okay, well, Olympics is four bladed. Well, Titanic's would be two. But I think one of the things when you're talking about the importance of original research, you know, not copying what other people have said, going back to the original documentation, is that uh, you begin to see the broader scope of the industry at the time. Propellers were very much a, um, an expendable component. One of the illustrations I use is that it's kind of like changing the tires on your car. Um, when, it, when you go into the shop, you might get snow tires for the winter. You might get summer tires um, for the summer season. You might get a tire with a slightly lower profile for better handling, or you might you know, get a nice comfy tire um, if you want a better ride over rough roads. And it's kind of the same way with propellers in the industry at the time. It was very much trial and error. Uh, when Lusitania and Mauritania were launched, they had three bladed propellers. And quickly they found they were lacking. And so they tweaked the pitch of the propeller blades. They tweaked the size of the blades. Uh, and then finally they went to four bladed propellers um, after just a couple of years. And a lot of these changes were happening, you know, faster than we changed the tires on our car in terms of miles. Um, so when you, when you look at the documentation, we should be more like, why didn't we think of this before? Why didn't we say to ourselves, you know, if the propellers really were such an expendable component, why weren't they tweaking the machinery? Even at the uh, U.S. inquiry, I believe it was, Bruce Ismay said that there were variations in Titanic's equipment. They were expecting better performance out of her. I think he said something like half a knot of speed or something like that. Um, so now suddenly the assumption that led everyone to say four bladed propeller, it doesn't look so rock solid. And then when Mark goes in and he finds not one piece of documented evidence, but multiple pieces. And then you start to analyze that photo of the propeller lying on the dock next to Titanic. And you realize it's a three bladed propeller when you model the computer and you, you can tell it's a three bladed propeller propeller instead of a four blade one. It's, it really is only a controversy when people aren't open to taking in fresh evidence and drawing new conclusions based on the fresh evidence. And it's, it's good to be skeptical, as you said, and not just to run out there, but so often we're, we're learning as we go. And, and we take the old myths, we compare the new documentation and we say, you know, wow, I don't know where they got that from back in the day, but you know, and it, and it really comes down to like, when you look at the existing evidence for, um, if you add one column for four bladed and then one for three, there, there is zero, uh, period documentation of any sort that points to a four bladed. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really kind of remarkable because it's not what we would have expected or anyone would have expected going into it, but it, it really, the only existing evidence is for a three bladed that specifically speaks to Titanic. In fact, we know yeah. that, Oh, go ahead, Bill. Um, I was going to say, and we have to keep up with the new, the new research. Um, I mentioned earlier reading the book, A Night to Remember. It's a great book. I've read it five or six times. I'll probably read it again one day. But it was written in 1955. Uh, Walter Lord did not have the data we have now. He updated his um, information in his second book about the Titanic, uh, A Night to Remember. But like I said, A Night to Remember is a great book. Everybody should read it. But keep in mind some of the information and it is outdated. And getting back to the propeller thing, this is the same situation. Mark came up with good, hard evidence to refute the four-bladed propeller idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, and then when you add in the fact that Olympic had a four-blade propeller to begin with, and then was briefly fit with a three blade propeller after the Titanic disaster. And then you look at some of the early um, engineering drawings of Britannic and you see the center prop on Britannic was originally slated to be three bladed in those drawings. 
I mean, suddenly, as as Mark as as Tad says, you you have the columns, and suddenly, <laughs> you know, there's there's nothing in the four blade column, and then the evidence starts stacking up for the three blade. So, but it, it is good to be skeptical and to make sure that you're not just making a um a quick conclusion, a, a quick assumption. But over time, it's it has really become available now. As, as Walter Lord said, it's a rash man that sets himself up as the final arbiter. So we trust Mark's research. We trust the documentation that we've got and the photograph that we have. But if someday someone goes down there to the wreck with a, with a sonar profiler and lo and behold, it's a four bladed propeller. Well, then it'll cause us to go back and we'll say, well, they were planning to put a three blade propeller on, but maybe in those last few weeks, they change their minds, but that doesn't, it doesn't seem likely at this point. Um, well, thanks. Yeah, uh, kind of, uh, it does. But was the Britannic fitted out with a four bladed Yeah. in the end? I believe it was right. Yeah. So I guess that's where, because I basically my research as of late has been on Britannic because I'm writing a fictional novel on Britannic and uh, it, it just raised the question where, yes, they were planning a three blade, but they ended it with a four blade. Olympic had a four blade, then they moved to a three blade. And the scan, you know, is the ultimate thing. And it didn't matter where I looked regarding those scans. No one ever talked about that center being obvious or evident. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where, okay, three, four, it doesn't really matter, but as you know historians uh, and, and the love for those ships it's like you know we want to know whenever there's a debate we want to know <laughs> you know we want that proof in the end i guess but uh yeah and, and harlan and wolf did have a lot of plans you know like they talk about the name gigantic for britannic and flip-flopping around there's many different things like that so it just raises questions about uh you know when will we actually know for sure you know but will we ever Human James, nature, I guess. You got a very comprehensive answer there, but nevertheless, uh, as, as was alluded to, that you know this this information keeps emerging, and yeah. that all, all um, historical research moves on with the emergence of new information. Um, I just wanted to um, chip in with something about honesty of glass, folks, uh, in relation to your collaboration on that book, um, and you know how it came to be. So was it something that you, you thought that all of the subject areas that are contained within the book needed that one source of information, that telling the story through original information? Is that something that you believe actually was delivered through that collaboration? Well, we hope so. Um, that that was the goal. Um, you know, that we we worked very hard to to go back to ground and to find the latest research that was available in 2010, 2011, back when we were first writing it. And we've tried to keep it up to date since then. We, we do have a, um, a comprehensive list of updates for a potential fourth edition that we have to take to the publisher. Um, and I think some of the findings that we've learned just since the third edition in 2015 will really shock people. Um, it's going to be pretty, pretty astounding. Some of the things we found, but and, and it's one of the things where we're very much in the spirit of wanting to share research and findings and not hoard information because we've seen individuals that that do that and or that work in a silo and reach conclusions based on the information they have in front of them, and then when they don't, what we like to do is share it with uh, trusted colleagues that we know are not going to just agree with us for the sake of agreeing with us because we're friendly, but we'll play devil's advocate and tear apart if they think what we've concluded is not supported by evidence. Um, and anybody that's writing a research, you know, I'd advise you to uh, find who your trusted people are and make sure that they'll tell you the truth and not just what you want to hear. Uh, and that'll make your work even better. So I think you've piqued people's interest there, uh, particularly you can't, um, you know, shocking revelations is something we're all going to be very interested in. So good, good. that's something we can look forward to. And I have no doubt we'll come back to that. Um, Christine, you were nodding head there as well. So I know you don't have 
a very, very specific question, but you wanted to make a comment? Oh, I, well, um, I'm not sure what you mean by the comment and what you mean by the question. I, my comment was that it's an honor to be able to listen yeah. and see face to face my uh, some heroes of my Titanic library. I mean, your your book is number one um, of my hundreds of books. Um, my my uh, question was whether any of you had seen the the new titanic movie that titanic unfold which deals with the aftermath of the disaster and the senate hearings in the u.s and just wondering if, what you thought of it if you have previewed it i'm planning to see it at the new york premiere in a couple weeks and several weeks and uh, just wondered if anybody had, had seen it and what they think of it so i had put that question to our guests tonight and they unfortunately haven't had an opportunity um, okay. To, to, okay. to see it but I know a note that within the little communication that you would passed on from yourself you had sort of queried the sort of the knowledge that we have around Senator Smith and how he's portrayed and it is back to that revisionism that sometimes happens over time and over the decades and um, what we know about Senator Smith and how he's portrayed in this latest movie as um opposed to how he was portrayed at the time of the inquiry and how that has changed. I, I don't know if any of our speakers tonight want to comment on their knowledge of Senator Smith. I know there, there was an error around the inquiries, um, obviously with the Senate inquiry in the United States, that they were trying to get jump in there and, and run that for ulterior motives rather than letting the board of trade um, do theirs first. And I, and I don't know that that's the case when you had um, vested interest in both parties on both sides of the Atlantic to investigate and make sure that um, they got to the bottom of what happened and um, any related safety changes that were going to need to be recommended based on just the sheer scale of the disaster. But I, I do feel like sometimes he was unfairly raked over the coals based on some, obviously he wasn't a person that was extremely well versed on maritime matters but um i think that sometimes held against him uh like he was glory seeking or trying to do something um uh, to boost himself when really um uh, that i don't believe that the historic record necessarily supports that um uh, and i'm interested to see how they portray it in this movie when i get a chance to see it if i um, remember correctly it's only being shown four places in the united states uh, Christine mentioned New York. Uh, does that sound right, Tad and Kent? There was only we only found it listed as four places. There, I looked the other day and I thought it was more than four, but they may have added some just in the last few days since we looked last. But it's not many. It's not playing anywhere near me. <laughs> so they should send it to Pigeon Forge or Branson. Yeah. We go. So would it help? Um, Susie, if you just briefly give, um, a, 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 I don't know, an overview without, because when we start talking about the movie, you, you know, you're going to give the plot away. <laughs> right. Um, yes, a number of us, as, as Jasmine said there, were at the premiere in Belfast, which was the UK premiere last night, including yourself, Aidan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is a movie I don't know that will do that well outside of the Titanic community. I'm not sure that the wider audience will be that enthralled with it because, you know, it does delve deep into the machinations of the, the Smith inquiry. Um, I, I find it very watchable. Um, it's great to get a new angle on Titanic. So it was uh, a lot of stuff that I didn't really know. Um, a lot of shadow cast on JP Morgan and his role on it all, which doesn't really resolve itself, but you know, you get the impression that JP Morgan was trying to pull the strings. Um, with regard to Christine's question about Senator Smith, uh, the movie portrays him as really giving up on his political ambitions uh, to be a presidential candidate by going with the truth rather than what President Taft wanted him to say. So, um, yeah, I guess that that's about all I can say um, regarding it without, you know, spoiling it for those of you who will hopefully see it. Um, it's going to 
uh, within the UK, London and Southampton, I think later this week. Uh, you mentioned Pigeon Forge. It actually is going to play in Knoxville, which isn't too far away from, from Pigeon Forge. No, and I think, less you know, than a half an hour. Yeah, yeah. So I think that was deliberate, you know, to, because the, the folks who run the, the Pigeon Forge facility are, are involved in, in helping them to put it on. But I think they're, they're trying to get a deal with Regal Cinemas in um, the US to get a wider distribution there. So you never know, it might pick up some traction and, and be more available um, as we get into April, May time. So anyway, I won't hog the airtime. I'll let you get on and, and back to other Thanks, people's Susie. thoughts. And Christine, is that, is that help a little understanding a wee bit about Smith? Because then once you see the movie, you'll maybe take that further and your own understanding of it. Good uh, here. Yes, that, um, thank you for those comments. And and I I hope it's worth my while. I just, uh, you know, got the another print of the U.S. Senate hearings transcripts <laughs> and i thought that before i see the movie i'm going to read them so i have some idea what to be watching for is what i think is like key things to be watching for um but uh i just hope that's worthwhile do you think that's a waste of time susie i i don't ever think that going back to the original source material is a waste of time <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> you have the time, Christine. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Does everybody know that both both the American and the British inquiries are online? The total inquiries. Uh, you can even download a, a Word document with both of them, and I find that very helpful for my research. Yeah, Bill, that's really helpful. And you may, maybe during the meeting we could look for those and fire those into the chat for folks. Um, particularly anybody that's interested in it as the film you know centers around the direct readout from the inquiry albeit in a limited way because the film's only an hour and a half i i certainly enjoyed it i know other folks on the call tonight that were there last night enjoyed it um but everybody would you know have different things to say about some of the plot lines and how it was presented and even some of the way it has been filmed. But yep, very, very good, very interesting. So Christine, thank you so much for that and enjoy the film when, it, when you do get to see it. So um, we've got another uh, person on the call tonight who um, in advance um, asked a couple of questions. So Ivan, you're in the spotlight. So it's great to hear that you're actually studying um, a ship. And it's the Lusitania, isn't it? And you've got a personal connection there. So it just um, it was an opportunity to distill down out of your comments the couple of questions that you had. Um, I think one of them is a sort of a technical question, isn't it, as to how to identify um, where on board someone was based? Yes. Um, it's it's great to meet the three of you. And... Um, and my question is that um, my great grand uh, grandmother uh, sailed over on the Lusitania in 1909 to meet my grandfather because um, he he was a quarryman up there and he went the year before and. I know that from my grandmother's papers that she was traveling second class and she was traveling alone with another woman with another woman from uh my local area and I'm trying to write a novel about her experiences and I'm trying <clears throat> excuse me, um, to do it as accurate as I can, but I can't find in, I can't find in her papers anything that alluded to where she was uh, birthed. And I was wondering if you could help me with the birthing of second class women and also, she she travelled with my great grandfather back in nineteen thirteen, and would they have then 
birth together or would they still be regarded as um a man um so i like to know your comments really with the rather technical question yeah hello it's a common question isn't it about sort of doing research on on chips of that era so anything i think would be useful to hear for anybody doing research at that time as to how how you go about that any comments it's actually a good question um did you have a thought tad i saw you unmuted yourself yeah I, that's a, a to narrow down to the specific cabin if, if you don't have um like a surviving ticket stub or or something of that sort would be very difficult um given the year period of years we could narrow down the sections of the ship where second class passengers would have been traveling um in between when they reconfigured some of those rooms and give a, a broad idea of where she may have been it won't be the specific cabin mm. um ar archives if you know the general range of when they would have been coming or going through ports in the united states or overseas you, you could possibly find immigration papers that would narrow down the specific days of the voyage or um when they arrived or checked in but the the specific cabin other than a general location on the ship would probably be very difficult uh, to find through that kind of archival material um but if that's helpful i mean we could probably narrow down this is where the cabins in that class were during this year and would give you at least a rough idea where she might have been well um, well well from her papers she, she traveled over there at the end of march 1909 and then she traveled back with my great grandfather sometime in november 1913. all right so i actually have a complete list that we've compiled of the crossings and voyages for the lusitania um, in March, 1909, I'm actually, I have it pulled up here. Uh, voyage number 23, that's a round trip voyage, uh, started with crossing 45 West on the 20th of March, 1909. And the ship called a Queenstown the next day. Sunday, the 21st of March, 1909. And the ship made New York on the 26th of March, 1909. It was a Friday. So if you're looking at the end of March, 1909, that's probably the crossing that she was on. It's westbound from Liverpool and Queenstown to New York. So March 20th through 26th was probably the one you're looking for. Um. Maybe that will help because what you can do is you can go to ellisisland.org and look at their um, records. They actually have the original manifests uh, that are copied from the microfilm. You might be able to see the actual line, you know, that her entry is on, uh, her occupation, her age, things like that. Unfortunately, they don't record room numbers in that document. Um, One thing you might want to see if you can find out is whether she had an inboard cabin or an outboard cabin. If she had an outboard cabin, she had a porthole. And that might even help narrow it down a bit. Mm -hmm. and, and married couples there would typically have been allowed to travel together if they were married at the time. Um, single, okay. single women uh, or single men would often be in different sections of the ship. Especially in third class. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. Okay, Ivan, you've um, got some useful pointers and actual information to consider taking forward. You had a second question, and I wonder because it's about you know the identification of bodies of the Lusitania. Is that something can't that could be done maybe by email? It was quite detailed uh, in relation to Ivan's wish to you know recognize those individuals that were from Wales. Is that something maybe we could take offline and help him out in some way? Yeah. Yeah. 
would that work for you, Ivan? Just because I know you, you're related yes. to your studies. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe we should just have a keep that conversation because it's quite detailed about your research. That that's good. Um, I, I'll help facilitate that with with the guys. That's that's great. Thank you. Um, with another just pre prepared question, and then we'll, we should open it up just to anybody. And if you can get your thinking caps on, just to be able to use this opportunity to something maybe is already sparked that you could come forward with in terms of adding to the discussion, a comment or a question. Um, Will Jackson, you've got a question, and I know it's uh, kind of an interesting one. It's about the concept of the disinformation, which we've sort of referred to in relation to the Titanic story, but its impact on, I suppose, safety at sea and other, other disasters, the idea that there's a potential tolerance of some of this uh, misinformation. So do you want to maybe articulate that question yourself? Yeah, and like I was just uh, direct messaging you, it was really uh, extensive in my email. Like all of you guys know who get emails from me, it's uh, very long. I'm looking at you, Cheryl. Um, but thank you guys for being here. It's um, really cool to talk to you directly. Always like it's cool to talk to Mark directly. Um, I had wondered... Do you guys feel like kind of the tolerated uh, disinformation from the Titanic story, you know, that kind of started a long time ago, even right after the inquiry, um, can almost contribute to modern uh, transportation disasters? You know, funny enough, I'm really interested in the D.C. metro. And after reviewing the NT, you know, our modern National Transportation Safety Board in the U.S., the NTSB, for some who don't know, in other countries, had actually essentially spread a conspiracy about the Titanic. And my point is not to correct them, uh, but they were referring to the steel, of course, disinformation that the brutal steel contributed to the actual disaster. But then they themselves disproved their argument because I think they were referring to the the Great Lake freighter Daniel J. Morrell, uh, because it as well had a brittle steel fracture, and their own report had the Coast Guard saying that the you know steel requirements were not updated until 1948. So they were referring to the NIST report from 91, but then there was a subsequent report in 98 that said you know, they had the best materials at the time, but then their own NTSB report said the same thing. So I guess my point is, these are very, very well-respected people who are believing conspiracies about the Titanic. So I just wonder if, like, you know, it's essentially creating accepted conspiracy think that could arguably contribute to, you know, modern disasters. Okay. Any comments, folks? It's a it's a good question. Um, when we got your message, I looked at it. Could it contribute to modern disasters? That aspect of it, my simple answer would probably be, I don't think so. However, uh, that being said, like you say, the information is the misinformation is out there. And it's widely accepted. Um, it takes off like wildfire as soon as the latest poorly researched documentary program comes out. Um, you know, whether it's Titanic was basically the towering inferno at sea or, um, you know, things of that nature. I know back in the mid 90s, it was all about their brittle steel. And, you know, supposedly using poor quality steel on the cheap just to, uh, you know, get the ships out the door. Um, that has been largely disproved. Um, partly because other ships using similar steel, including Olympic, held up so well throughout their careers. They, you know, Olympic in later years, she suffered a few defects that were pretty common to ships of that era um in fact however she fared better 
than many of the other liners on the Atlantic at the time, and especially the German ships. Um, the former Imperator, Vaterland and Bismarck, which became Berengaria, Leviathan, and Majestic. Um, those ships suffered serious defects. Of course, there's engineering defects. If you go later, uh, World War II, the Liberty ships, um, you know, those were known to have some problems because they were being thrown together so quickly. Um, even today, a uh, developing story that many people may be hearing about is, you know, a lot of questions at Boeing these days about safety concerns. You know, are they catching things uh, when they come through? So I don't think that the misinformation would lead to future catastrophes. There's always a possibility, but it's it distorts the perception of Titanic takes it away from the reality and it kind of colors the viewpoint of modern people who have an interest in the subject against, you know, for example, JP Morgan has come up his role in white star Olympic and Titanic is greatly misunderstood. If you read some books or watch some TV programs, you think he was basically over at Belfast um, you know, telling them to use cheap steel and, um, you know, threatening to hit people over the head with his cane if uh, if they were dropping an extra extra quid on it unnecessarily. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not at all um, the picture. So I think it, it just it's a distortion of the historical record more than anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. And I guess. um you know, I really know a lot about uh, railroads, especially, so I don't know as much about, you know, I, I've learned a little bit about, you know, the 737 MAX, but, you know, I guess looking deeper into the S NTSB, I, I guess I, I see what you're saying, that there's not necessarily like a causal link between, okay, well, disinformation is tolerated from the Titanic, and so... You know, it's almost like humans, I'll never forget Captain Sullenberger said um, during the 737 MAX hearings, as humans, we're all subject to hindsight bias. So it seems like that's always kind of been an issue. You know, it's not necessarily, oh, the Titanic sparked that. That's all, it's almost like a coincidence. And I would caution anybody just in general, like Kent did a pretty good summary there, but if you look at the record of the RMS Olympic and the long service and how it was built from the same materials, the same general uh, plans and everything else and how well held up compared to its contemporaries, that should be uh, proof enough against poor construction, poor materials, poor steel. But that that will get recycled again in a few years. You guys will see another – somebody will come out with another twist on that uh, just like they did with the uh, coal fire. That's something that was known in 1912 and then – gets repackaged every couple of decades as something new that nobody knows about when that's been debunked time and time again. <laughs> One thing I'll add to what Tad just said is uh, not only was it using the same materials and the, everything else at Harlan and Wolf, it was using the same people. You, you, you can't think that they're going to do sloppy work on one ship and great work on the others. It, it's the same people. They've got the same habits. It's all the same. I think it was almost like, you know, the perfect storm. Uh, I think Mike Brady has a really great episode about the uh, steel issue. And I think that, you know, like I said, Lake Freighters in the U.S. had the same issue. The Daniel J. Morrell had a really awful, you know, sinking. But I think my dad, once we were talking about this, had a great you know, perspective that it's kind of like saying Amelia Earhart got lost because she didn't have a GPS. You know, they, they did not understand the issue at the time. It's kind of like, well, no one could have imagined, I'm not trying to be, you know, awful by saying this, no one could have imagined 9-11, you know, someone crashing an airliner into the Twin Towers. And I'm not, I would not, you know, I'm a big safety guy that's what I'm interested in. I'm not trying to defend the Titanic if it was not safe, but it's simply not accurate. And I just think Mike Brady, like I said on YouTube, has a great 
episode about this. So it's it's interesting because it's almost like the Titanic itself is less interesting what happened because it's not very mystical. And so it almost makes it more interesting to find out why is there all this dif disinformation because we kind of know what happened, right, with the engineering and shipbuilding at the time. So that makes it more interesting to me, at least. Yeah, I mean, here we are. We're coming up on the 112th anniversary. The basic story has never changed. The ship was on its maiden voyage. It hit an iceberg and it sank. And, you know, nearly 1,500 people uh, lost their lives. Um, and I think there is a tendency for people to try to find a new angle on the subject, um, to try to reinvent the wheel. It couldn't have been as simple as that. It had to be, there had to be some deeper reason. It, it was either the ships were badly built or they were trying to swap it for an insurance claim or, you know, the, there was a fire on board, but they had to get to New York because Bruce Ismay said they had to get to New York. These, these crazy ideas um, that have been put out there and you look at the historical record and none of it makes any sense in fact many modern portrayals of some of these historical characters um especially i think bruce ismay comes to my mind um but there are others as well they're almost caricatures of who the historical record actually shows them to be um yeah and the it, that's yeah, go ahead, Ted. Point. That's an excellent point, Kent. Um, you look at Ismay in particular, he makes a convenient villain in a movie, but you look at the reality, you have someone that didn't sneak off in the first boat as the papers made it sound, but spent the whole sinking helping passengers and, and crew members into the boats and and um until very late in the sinking and was vilified just because he survived. But yeah. he makes a convenient villain and all these movies and documentaries kind of run with that portrayal and don't really bother to look if it's factual or not. Yeah. Uh, Todd, could we bring in Cliff Ismay just because, you know, we've talked a lot about um, Bruce Ismay and we've got Cliff here in the meeting here tonight. So not only, you know, related to Bruce Ismay, but having written, you know, the latest volume in relation to Cliff, uh, sorry to Bruce, it would be nice if Cliff, you were able to comment. So if you're able to to join uh, the, uh, the conversation, please, um, um, do so. You've you've come off mute there. So did you do you hear that? Just a little discussion. I think it was useful. Just that they were commenting that there has been uh, you know some revisionism of of um, the role of Bruce Esme and how he was treated. Yeah, thanks. Can, can you hear me okay? I'm having trouble with my camera. Yeah, no, we, we can see your good photographs, so we don't need to see yeah. your moving face. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, a lot of people will be relieved to hear that. Um, yeah, thanks for asking me to to comment on that. So I've just jumped into the meeting and I did hear the last few comments made by Tad and Kent. Um, yeah, I mean, that was it, wasn't it? Um, as I always say, every good movie it requires three main characters or narratives. You have to have a hero, you have to have a love story, and you have to have a coward. Um, and with, with Bruce, he fit into that category, not just by... Hollywood and other filmmakers, of course, he started long before that with his fallout with Bruce, with um, uh, Randolph Hearst. Uh, and, you, you know, once once you get a story like that, it sticks and everyone seems to follow the same narrative. Um, and, I mean, I've got to got to applaud um, Kent and Tad for it and everyone else involved with Honesty of Glass because it was excellent research work. And I, I think they understood a lot of what really happened. Uh, for me, it was when I was writing my book and I started to gather first-hand evidence that had never been seen before. And I thought, yeah, you know, these guys have it nailed. That's Bruce was badly represented uh, and still is in a lot of ways. So, you know, it's it's nice to to see that people are, are finally getting around to that way of thinking, seeing the truth as it as it really was. If you read the inquiry transcripts and all the people that mentioned Bruce Ismay helping people into the lifeboats, maybe getting a little overexcited to where Lowe had to tell him, "You need to get out of my way here," but he helped maybe a hundred, well, more than a hundred people into lifeboats at the least. Yeah. yeah. So it went from lifeboat to lifeboat 
and he only got in, into the one of the last two boats that was successfully launched. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're right there. I worked press. it out. Sorry, I worked it out about 110 people, I think, um, okay. that I found evidence that I helped into the live boats. There were probably more. Um, but, yeah, that, that was the case. He, he did what he could before he left the ship. And a lot of people that owe their lives to him, as well as many other uh, people on board the Titanic. I mean, lots of people were, were trying to save lives. It wasn't just Bruce, of course. But as Bruce is what is subject to what we're talking about, he, he did. And I think one of the, the best stories I uncovered was a passenger called... Um, Oh, what was her name? She was Australian. Um, you know, the name will come to me, but she was um, she was a stewardess doubling up as a nurse, and she was refusing to... Uh, uh, Marsden, Miss Marsden. Uh, she was refusing to get in the lifeboat saying, well, I'm a stewardess, only a stewardess. I <laughs> said to her, what are you talking about? You're all women getting that blinking lifeboat and she did and she helped draw that lifeboat to safety because she was an experienced horse person there's not a lot known about it because for whatever reason she wasn't um she wasn't called at either the american or british inquiries uh but with the evidence i uncovered it puts bruce on the port side of the ship as well I think most people think he walked up and down the starboard side and back to lifeboat C, but he actually moved over to the port side of the ship to Elizabeth uh, to Miss Marsden's lifeboat, which is sixteen, and then he moved down to the to the front of the ship to lifeboat number two before he went back onto the starboard side. So there's a lot of a big story that needs to be told there. Cliff, thanks for that. And just to clear up, because we did comment on it earlier, did you contribute directly to the um, uh, uh, film? Uh, unsinkable Titanic control. Me? Yeah. No, um, no, I, I didn't contribute directly. Um, I may be in a position where I'll be helping promote it so um, Yes. But no, I wasn't. I wasn't involved in in the the information gathering or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have to interrupt. Bill. I have to check Bill. off right now. Um, it was nice to talk to everybody. Oh, Bill, we're losing you. Look, thank you so much. Yep. Um, hopefully we gave everybody some good information. Anyway, um, goodbye. Will, will you come back again? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. We'll, we'll see you again. Brilliant. Thanks okay, so Bill. much, Bill. Bye. Bye, Bill. Okay, so there's a couple Bye. of other there's a couple of other things raised there about the construction of the ship and in particular brittle steel so could i just ask b and halifax to comment because you wanted to comment about the latest research from steve blasco hi everyone this is d from good Hal to see you d society of atlantic canada good to see everyone and um and i want to thank everyone for their kindness and kind words as i recover from surgery so i'm really glad to be here today um, one of the things I wanted to comment on was we were speaking about, you know, the accuracy of research and the idea of allowing oneself to, to move with new information that comes up. So I remember in a conversation with Charlie Haas, he said there's two different types of researchers, some who leave very strongly in the, in the research that's been done and the information that's provided. And then there are others who, as new information unfolds, will take things more, more than with a grain of salt and, and do further research and be able to gather more information because as time goes on, new research comes to light, new information comes to light. And he felt, as I do too, it's important to, to allow those things to happen. I right? allow that because that accurate information is what gives what, is what keeps history alive and keeps history moving from my perspective. And when it comes to Steve Blasco, on the brittle steel, he did quite a lot of research on that, and there was a lot of pushback for him at times with regards to the, you know, the accuracy of the information when it came to the brittle steel. Well, it was brittle, and that's what happened. Well, we do know that there was a lot of research done, and you know, the steel that was used at the time that that was commonly used, again used for the Olympic and other ships, and they didn't they didn't have the same they didn't reach the same fate. But yet, you know, it's important to. Uh, 
to understand that no, the, the, the steel wasn't wasn't brittle as, as as it was explained. So, if you get a chance to read any of Steve Blasco's um research and writing about that, it is very interesting. Any comments? Can Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's um, a a good good comment, yeah. Dee, about uh, taking everything in the context because uh, yeah, if the steel was substandard. Uh, if it's a substandard in any way, it would be by comparing against modern standards and techniques that weren't existing. Uh, they weren't something that was industry standard back in 1912. So, of course, if you look at a piece of metal that was manufactured then compared to the purity of now, it's not going to be the same. But the real question is how would it hold up compared to contemporary manufacturing? Exactly. And I think that's what people need to you know, to keep in top of mind when you're doing that type of, this type of research. Things change over time. The way things were manufactured, created in 1912, very different from today. Yeah. Well, and we'll just throw this into the mix, food for thought. Tad and I, you know, we do a lot of research that's beyond just Titanic or Olympic, Titanic, Britannic. We look at the, the broader maritime field very often. And one of the interesting things that's come up uh, recently, there's been claims that Olympics original design titanic's original design was substandard so they went and they changed olympic in 1913 they made her stronger and that's why she lasted as long as she did it's an unfortunate claim that doesn't really have any basis in reality um first of all the technical nature of the changes really didn't strengthen olympic very much at all um when you look at what was exactly done to the ship but furthermore there was another liner that harlan and wolf built um, beside Britannic, it was called the Justicia. And Tad and I have done quite a bit of research on, on her story through the years. One of the things that we've found, Justicia did not have a watertight inner skin. Uh, basically, she was more a carbon copy of Olympic and Titanic's original design uh, based on the scale of the Lusitania, about 30-odd thousand tons, and made from much the same steel stock as Olympic and Titanic. Um, and in fact, and, was was built on the gantry right next to the Britannic when it was being constructed. Yeah, and you can actually see her hull next to Britannic's. Um, and that liner uh, became the, uh, the, it was the Staten Dam under one name and then Justicia when she finally was in service. She was um, torpedoed during World War I now, everyone here knows Lusitania was torpedoed and sank in, you know, about 20 minutes, um, taking a horrible list to starboard, you know, impossible to launch the lifeboats, you know, panic. But on Justicia, um, how many torpedoes was it, Ted? I keep having to ask you because I keep forgetting the number and the number of hours that it took for the whole thing to play out. Well, it was really over the course of two days, it was torpedoed and basically disabled initially and then they got it back up uh and was pursued by no less than three u-boats over the course of parts of two days uh, and by the time they sank it it had taken six direct torpedo hits um uh, and had a number of other ones fired at it um and even at that point it didn't it didn't capsize until it was going under uh and then it sank in relatively shallow water upright um and it just, and it, like I said, if you compare the materials it was built out of and to take that many torpedo strikes and it really took that many to, to put it under is remarkable. And it, if the steel was substandard um, by any means, what they were using um, in the shipyard at Arnold and Wolf, uh, there's no way it could have lasted as long as it did. I mean, it, it's pretty remarkable to be struck that many times and not just completely go under in minutes like Lusitania did. It's a, yeah. it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that we wanted to convey, particularly to the members of the Belfast Titanic Society. Um, I've been to Belfast once. Um, I got to tour the museum. I got to see many of the, the local sites. But Tad and I were, were based in the United States. We're very much kind of on the outside, whereas for many of you, it's much more local knowledge. Now, our understanding is that over the years in Belfast, Titanic had kind of become a taboo subject, um, maybe even something that there was some shame or embarrassment felt, you know, about for, for many of the people in the community. And 
while we were addressing your society there in Belfast and your members there in that area in particular, we wanted to make a point to, to, to really mention, you know, even though people are talking about it now, the people in Belfast really have every reason to be proud of those ships, Olympic and Titanic, everything that we're finding um, is that they were well-built uh, they were better built than many of their um, competitors, um, even Lusitania and Mauritania. Ted and I have done a lot of research on and, and there's this glib line that's out there that Lusitania was much better built than Titanic. Well, our research really indicates the opposite. Um, Olympic and Titanic, uh, Harlan and Wolf had considered, for example, longitudinal bulkheads that were used on the Cunard ships and had they considered them dangerous. And they decided against adopting them because they were worried about this sort of scenario that Lusitania actually experienced and Mauritania also experienced. So I think that was one of the things we really wanted to make a point of, of telling you what our research is telling us, that those ships were, they were remarkable vessels. Um, mm -hmm. And so you definitely have reason to be proud of the work that went into them. Yeah, no, that's really good to hear articulated. So thank you for that. And um, folks, just to let you know that in a kind of pre-conversation, I've been trying to entice our speakers tonight over to Belfast. And I think we even got as far as discussing, you know, where you could get a direct flight from and so on. So we hope we hope that, that you know, the seed is sown now. Look, there's been a couple, well, a lot of comments in the chat there, and I hope people are keeping an eye on them. They're, they're coming in quite fast there and a few of them just on that subject of you know the concept of the steel and the construction of the ships and so on but look, there's a couple of other ones so should we try and get a couple more questions in um so jasmine should we start with you it's a kind of quite short question but it's very different so do you want to just come on and make your question Yes, well, um, basically we had a, a meeting. Well, I've been in the Titanic Society now since I'm 17 and I'm now 42. So my memory's not what it used to be <laughs> about all of the different meetings we've attended and been to. But I do remember hearing at one of our meetings, but I just wanted to find out a bit more about it or if the guys knew, that during the building of the construction of Titanic, when they were rivered in the large panels onto the side, um, obviously there was a lot of accidents in the shipyard at the time and uh, people were injured and killed and things. But um, apparently somebody uh, was on the inside fixing at the rivets when they were doing the out pan putting the panels on the outside and he actually got encased inside the ship and he was trapped there and they could hear the tapping, but they couldn't do anything about it and they couldn't get him out. And obviously he would have been trapped and died in there. But is that something that they've heard and is that true? And if so, do you think that sort of summoned the bad omen really for the whole thing? You want to take first crack at it, Ted? Yeah. yeah Thank we, you for the question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we've heard that same story over the years, too, and that that's um, one that appears to be uh, a myth. Um, but certainly there, the fact that there were some individuals that were injured and killed in the shipyard during construction, that that is uh, factual. Uh, you had one individual that fell. You had another one that uh, was crushed by timbers uh, where there's a the, the, the dispute about the date when that happened. But um, yes, there was some significant injuries and, and fatalities in the construction, but the the one story about them being encased inside the ship doesn't seem to be one that that really happened. I'm not, fact, not sure where it, where it originated. <laughs> yeah, what's interesting but, about that story is that it goes back much further than Titanic. Um, that story actually has sort of been recycled going all the way back to the Great Eastern back in the mid 19th century. Supposedly there was someone who was trapped in the hull of the Great Eastern and they couldn't find them and couldn't get them out. I think from a technical standpoint with Titanic, my, my biggest question would be, well, where would someone have gotten stuck inside the ship where, you know, they couldn't get out? Because most places, if you're inside working, and they're putting hull plates on the outside. Well, if you've if you've seen the plates, you know, down in the um, pictures of the boiler rooms or the engine rooms, you can see the ribs and you can see the outer hull plates, you know, at least in 1911, 1912, before the inner skin on Olympic. 
And there really wasn't much of a place for people to get stuck where they couldn't get out. Even with the double bottom, uh, there were areas where people could get through manholes, you know, and even during the sinking, they lifted some of the manholes to go down and check some of the pumps that were in the double bottom. Uh, there were fresh water tanks that, that you know, were frequently inspected. Uh, they had access points. So I don't think there was really any place for someone to get trapped. Um, but as Tad said, there were accidents in the shipyard. And this is another interesting thing that our research over the years did. There's such a, a quick to judgment about safety in Harlan and Wolf. You know, oh, did you know so many people died in, in, in the construction of Olympic and Titanic? It was truly horrible. It shows they were going after profit. They didn't care about the human toll. Well, that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny in context because there is much more of a safety conscious environment in the workplace in modern years than there was, you know, 80, 90, 100 plus years ago. Um, high visibility vests, eye protection, ear protection, hard hats, um, safety harnesses if you're up above a certain number of feet. Um, you know, that, that's a common thing in our culture. But back then, they had ratios, they had formula where you can expect X number of deaths for every number of tonnage or every number of dollars or pounds that were spent in construction. Even uh, projects like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco in the United States, people fell to their deaths. Um, safety harnesses weren't in place uh, or collapsed. And it unfortunately was just things happened. One of the things in, in my research that really stood out to me, though, was um, Thomas Andrews was well known for going through the shipyard, you know, every day. And it was reported that if he saw someone that was doing something risky or stupid, something that they that they could get hurt by or killed by. You know, we all think of Thomas Andrews as, you know, this kind of lovable character, but he was known to be able to give them the, I think the phrase was the rough side of his tongue, you know, if he came across anybody that was doing anything like that. Um, and he also viewed many of those people as uh, there was a report, he was with his wife and the, the workers were coming out and, you know, he said to his wife, those are my mates, you know, so these aren't people who didn't care. Um, and I think that's an important thing to, to remember when we look back on the construction and the lives that unfortunately were lost. It, Harlan and Wolf was actually a safer place than many shipyards and construction sites of the time. And, yeah, and I've, ne I, I've never seen anything that really makes it sound like there was an abnormally high number of um, deaths or injuries compared to other ships at the time when they were building them. It's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty standard for the, the time period and maybe even a little bit safer, as Kent said. Yeah, just a couple of things there just to add in for the folks on the call that the Society has access to the Harland and Wolf Finds book covering the period of the construction of Titanic. And, you know, you can see firsthand the health and safety references where, you know, workers were fined for, uh, in inverted commas, putting in too thin boards, for example, or, you know, dropping chain links from the scaffolding, etc. Um, so there's a lot there um, to support what Kent said. And, and Tad, you just mentioned about the discrepancy of some of the dates about the death surrounding the launch. And, you know, we pinned that down to the day after the launch using the inquest data on the reports in the newspaper. So, again, going back to some original documentation can sort of suss that out. So we have another question, folks. It's from... Ed, so Ed, you were interested in collapsible boat B. Okay, can you hear me, Ed? Yes, okay. go ahead, Ed. Good to talk to you. Right, and uh, big thanks to the panel for all they do, and I would include Mark in that as well. My question was in relation to collapsible B. Or sort of collapsible A as to whether the panel would agree that um, that particular boat was, I think, filled, almost filled with people uh, who were then washed out of it when the forward funnel 
created a massive wash and that the boat did slip away from the ship all right um almost half full because the the uh, cork uh, hadn't been placed in at the bottom of it the plug and i'm just wondering whether the panel agree that it's quite likely quite a lot of people who thought they were in safety or about to be in safety were in fact killed uh, when they were washed out of that collapsible before it left the deck i, I would agree ed and that's a good question because uh, I think a uh, steward Edward Brown, um, some of the people that were on the scene, like second class passenger William Mellers, you have a number of accounts, uh, quite a few actually, of of passengers that were either standing by collapsible A or placed into it before when they were attempting to get it over the edge of the ship. And you have to remember that there was a a ten degree or more port list at the time, so they were pushing collapsible A up the against that list to the edge of the deck. Uh, they had it hooked up to the falls, and then that's when the boat deck uh, started submerging, and they had to quickly free uh, and hack those ropes away to get it to free from the deck. And, and um, what ended up happening, you have Mellers gives a very detailed account where as as people were trying to climb aboard, it would almost upset. Uh, so it would it almost tip over. It was very unstable in the water. It was flooded. Um, August Venerstrom, same thing, that where people would get in, and then they were tossed out time and time again. Uh, George Reams, the French first class passenger, same thing where he got in more than once and was thrown out. Uh, and then again, you have the wash from when the forward funnel fell. Uh, so the number of people that were originally in that collapsible that actually survived in it, would I'd say would be very few because uh, most of them that did climb in had to get back into it more than once when they uh, basically almost tipped over. And you can imagine every time you end up in the water, you, you're losing energy and getting weaker and weaker. And um, by the end, there was only 12 to 15 that were in it that survived out of um, at least 20 some that were in it originally, maybe even more. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. Um, I must say that, you know, your, your very fine book on the sea of glass, to my mind, captures the panic that must have been there when that those two collapsibles, A and B, when they were trying to get them off. Um, You've done fantastic work, uh, the three of you. And I'm also um, glad you mentioned Mark as well, because I think he does fantastic historical work. So, like, guys, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Keep up the good work. I'm amazed there's a fourth version <laughs> about to come out, uh, because it's there's an awful lot of reading in the one that I have. And, and uh, had you'd been asking been about there. you'd been asking about how long it took to compile. Yes, indeed. Yes. Well, thank thank you first off for those comments, and I would I would yeah. second exactly what you said about Mark's research and work uh, for sure. We have very high opinion of him. If we've not made that clear, we, I can't say enough about his work and what he does. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, with regard to the fourth edition, we don't know how long it'll be before it comes out. Mm -hmm. We're still putting the finishing touches on the updates to the text. Um. But I think it would have been easier to write the book again from scratch than it's been to um, pull it apart piece by piece and update. Uh, and I know Tad can Tad can probably back me up on some of the, uh, the many hours that we spent trying to to fit in the new research and the new findings. But once we finish our part, which is uh, creating this revised manuscript. Um, then we have to take it to the publisher and we have no idea what that process will be. Um, you know, whether they will continue in the same format, whether they'll want a different format, we don't know how long it will take to go to press. Uh, I I've said before, you know, it, it could easily be a year before it becomes available. Um, because we haven't even finished the revisions. Uh, in fact, our work on Lusitania that we've been doing lately, Tad and I, um, I know Bill is very keen to get our work on the fourth edition manuscript done. And so frequently of late, you know, he'll say, Hey, you know, I've got a little time and Pat and I are like, um, we can't, <laughs> we're on a tight deadline with Lusitania. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think many of you will be surprised at how much has stayed the same. You'll still get the same feel when you're reading it. Um, you almost have to have the original, and the fourth edition side by side to, to tell where the changes are because of some of the subtleties. 
but in other areas it's going to be like oh wow um that's that's a big one a uh, big big change so we we hope that everyone enjoys it when it does become available but don't don't think it's going to be available next week or next month that's the upshot but the great thing is that you can give that feedback, can't you? Because you're hearing tonight that there's a great hunger for that kind of format and the work that you've done and the fact that people want to see it updated. So you've, you've already got the, the mandate. Yeah. And exciting. I think one of, the, one of the things that we've taken to heart too is like we don't get to pick the size of the the formatting of the book. That's And the, the print is extremely small and, and that's the biggest complaint that we've gotten over time. And we've we're certainly have passed it on to the publisher. And, and as I get older, I sympathize because my eyes aren't quite as good as they were uh, three or four years ago, even. Yeah. So, um, Todd and Kant, I don't know if you've been keeping track on the chat. It's quite hard because there's so much in there. And there's actually a lot that's probably relevant to reading in a wee bit more detail, particularly about the Lusitania there. There's a couple of quite detailed comments. Um, so something maybe that when we finish this, that the chat we can export to you guys so you can maybe take that away and have a look at it in, in a wee bit more detail. There's some suggestions there about stuff that maybe you aren't aware of, particularly from Ivan and Sandra in, in your comments. Um, at this stage, you know, we're coming on an hour and a half into the conversation. I wonder, is it time just to draw close formally on some of the questions because we've heard so much? And if we hear too much, we won't be able to invite you back because we'll have heard everything. So um, the great thing is that if there's always some unanswered questions, that means you can come back at some stage. And it would indeed be great to come back and we will officially invite you. Um, so the other thing about the chat is that it's just full of, you know, full of, you know, really interesting comments about your work and its contribution to the Titanic world. And I hope you take that on board because there's a lot of very complimentary comments. I can see that. It's um, yeah. That's I was just scrolling through now. <laughs> it's it's humbling uh, to read these comments, and we appreciate the feedback very much. It's you know we do all the work. Um, and we don't know what the reaction is going to be to the work. And um, so it, it really does make it worth it to know that people are out there and reading it and enjoying it and learning. Because um, as we always say, it's not about us. We're only trying to tell the story of these people that went through a horrific experience almost 112 years ago. Even if they survived, for most of them, their lives were forever changed by what happened they either lost a loved one or a friend in the disaster or even if they didn't lose anyone that they know they knew just the horror of what they went through um you know stayed with them and um you know so we always try to to tell that story as best we can and we, we appreciate that it, it it affects people what we do thank you and it, it, isn't it remarkable though Tad? Uh... Can't though that Mark Chernside has been getting so com so many compliments and he hasn't spoken at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And all he has put forward so far is that we know that the toilet pants has been the subject of his research. So <laughs> Mark, do you do you want to say hello? Yeah, happy to uh, happy to do so. Someone was uh, trying to deliver a pizza to me, which I which I hadn't ordered. <laughs> someone's someone's missing their dinner but uh i've uh i've just got back it seems to uh happen every time i'm on one of these calls um i think i'd shared it with you kent it might have been a while back there was some comment um this was early in lusitania's career and it's just one of those things that probably looks fine on the drawing board but you know once you've got the ship at sea just that practical experience and um yeah it was reported I, I don't know which class it was um but essentially the lavatory pans whether it was the shape they were certainly recorded as too shallow but of course when the ship pitched or rolled um you know the uh the the contents the water came out and over so uh, i feel quite sorry for the stewards having to do uh, an awful lot of mopping up 
and uh, I'm not really sure what you can uh, do about that unless you uh, try and avoid storms, which is a bit hard to do when you're uh, on the North Atlantic. And Very that was nice that Ivan had that same experience in recounting the stories down from his uh, great grandmother in, in relation to yeah, that's great. So yeah. Mark, Mark, you you're getting a check from these guys. <laughs> well. <laughs> He sent us a check for the. Uh, that's what he said. He was joking. Yeah. Send a check um, in the post. So, brilliant. Yeah, I spelt it wrong. I spelt it in uh, British English rather than American English. So, uh, corrected that. I think okay. with the the comments from Gunter and you in the thread there that I just read about our book, we'll have to send the check back. <laughs> oh, right, okay. yeah, I think so. They'll <laughs> they'll pass in the in the mail. Oh yes, yes, that's. Uh, so it just remains for me officially to thank you guys for being part of our meeting tonight. And I really um, believe that your wish to make it very interactive and to address the questions and comments and discussion points for people has really worked because we've, we've had a lot of engagement there. And I meant what I said about extending an invite to another session at some point. We obviously run an annual program, so maybe we can come back to you and or look for nodding heads so that you would at least receive the email and consider mm -hmm. to come back again because I think it's quite a nice way to engage with everyone in the Titanic world uh, from our from our society. We would love that very much. And we hope that everyone here can join us um, every year. Many of you may know that we're, we do a live stream on the anniversary of the disaster. Uh, for those poor souls in the UK that um, are four or five hours ahead of us in the US, it may be a very inconvenient time. Uh, we start at 9.30 or 10 in the evening in the uh, east coast of the US, and that would equate to 2.30 or 3, your time over there in the UK. Um, but the events actually play out um, in real time for the sinking, taking into account daylight saving time and the time difference to Titanic's clocks. But we're doing that again this year. We have some really, um, I think, some nice surprises in store for everyone. Um, I think the conversation that we'll have that night is going to be a lot of fun. And just like today, we welcome questions. We love to hear what, what you guys are wondering and to, to try to answer those questions. So, you know, hit us for the live stream. Ask us questions there when we come back. You know, don't be nervous about asking, you know, your questions. We, we just love to interact and to, to help understand. Okay. So, Kent, is that something that, um, is it done through a Facebook page? So it's not a specific link to the live stream, but it's on a, a, a place, shall we say? It's, it's done on YouTube on the channel Part-Time oh, right. yeah. Explorer every year. Yep. Okay. We'll, so we we'll have some some neat surprises in store, I think, for everyone this year. Yeah. It's just over yeah. a month away. Mm -hmm. so. Kind of kind of wish we could talk about it, but we can't yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, you guys, I know, are also strong not only in the Titanic story but on marketing. You always have that nice way of leading people <laughs> into wanting <laughs> to hear more. So, um, just repeat that about the YouTube channel. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's YouTube channel Part Time mm -hmm. Explorer. Part for many of you that have been around the Titanic community for years, you may know the name Tom Linsky. That's his yeah. channel. And he hosts us every year. Um, we have a, a panel of historians. We try to get as many um, experts in the field to join us as possible. Um, and we're, we really like seeing that, that real-time interaction where the questions come up and, and we can answer them in real time, especially on the anniversary of the sinking when, yeah, we're watching it happen, you know, basically yeah. in real time. Um, is that something, do you know, that once um, it's live that Tom records it and plays it back at a later stage? Yeah, so that yeah, could they, be done as well. Yeah. He puts that up just every year that there'll be a video after the fact with the recorded version if somebody doesn't want to stay up until the wee hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, just finally, um, for from either of you, or from both of you, I should say, um, separately then from your Titanic life, what, what outside of that is something that when you want to put the Titanic story over to the side, what what else do you get interested in that's not Titanic related? Do you, do you have other interests? 
We do. There's, there's um, no time. There's no time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the problem is there's only 24 hours of the day. When, when I'm not working on Titanic or Lusitania or other ships, I'm working in my family business. Um, we uh, tune and restore and maintain pianos. Um, and so uh, that, that keeps us busy when we're not doing this. Um, um, would, you, would you mind then if I asked you just to comment very briefly because I'm joining it up now about Olympics piano? Isn't that Olympics piano? Yeah. Um, the piano from Olympics a la carte restaurant reception room uh, has recently surfaced. Uh, first it was in Germany. Now it's in the UK. And uh, I've been asked to be part of the board of a legally registered nonprofit organization that was formed a couple of months ago called the RMS Olympic Steinway Association. And we've been working very hard to raise the money to purchase the piano and to put it on semi-permanent display, a semi-permanent home. Uh, in one of the Titanic museums, we don't know yet which one it would be, whether it would end up being Belfast, Southampton, uh, Pigeon Forge, uh, you know, other options available, but making it so that it doesn't disappear into a private collection and uh, making it so that the public can see the piano, see the connection with Olympic and Titanic. It's the closest thing that you will ever hear to an instrument that was actually apparently on Titanic, um, made in the same factory, by many of the same workers. Uh, the cabinet was done by the same people who did all of Olympic and Titanic's pianos. Um, and so we, we really hope to be successful in that so that we can share that with the, uh, not only the Titanic and maritime community, but also uh, those who have an interest in musical history as well. Um, so it's, it's a big project that's taking up uh, quite a bit of our time. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad I've asked that because it's very interesting to have this shared the link for that. Um, and, you know, we hope and wish it every success. And I know you and I have exchanged the wish that I think one of the board will come and speak to us as a society separately about that in our next year's program so we can hear a lot more detail about the piano and, and your aspirations for it. Just, you know, out of interest, has the, the fundraising taken off? Is that something that's going to happen in the future? Or we started uh, at the beginning of the year and um, we're hoping to raise the funds during this calendar year. Um, we don't know if it'll happen or not. That depends on the support of, of people around the world, but we're, we're hopeful because the piano is for sale. Um, and at any point, someone with deep pockets, mm -hmm. you know, could basically yes. walk in off the street with a higher offer or a quicker offer. And, um, we know what happened to another one of Olympics pianos back in the nineties. Um, and no one knows where it is now. And we don't want that to happen here. So. Okay. Well, we'll keep close contact with that. Thank you so much, Ken. So Tad, you've got other interests that when you go to bed at night, you think of other things than Titanic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> as far as, as far as writing, I mean, World War One, um, other liners, the Aquitania, Lusitania, all of that, but uh, I love traveling. That's one of my big passions. And then my biggest job, most important one, I said, I have a, a little one at home that, that keeps me very occupied, which uh, she's a wonderful daughter. So yeah. that, that's primarily what I do outside of this. <laughs> and are the travels related to the maritime industry or sector or history, or is it just travel for pleasure? Mostly for pleasure, but I'd like to mix in some of that. Uh, uh -huh. Belfast being a top target. Yeah, so you have to get that on your travel des destination. Um, we'll, we'll, we will facilitate information for both you and Kent to come over and Bill as well. So we, we've already um, hooked in Mark Chernside. He comes every year. So uh, we've got that organized, Mark. Yeah, and we've actually got Mark organized for something for September for this year. So look, thank you guys. We're going to go into sort of like a more informal part of the meeting. It just remains for me to announce our next talk, which unusually is in two weeks time. It's the first, I think maybe the second time we've done twice in a month. And um, our speaker is actually on the call. And I was just going to call upon you, Sandra, just to say very briefly what, what we're going to be looking at in the next um, meeting on the 25th. 
Uh, just to say how much I enjoyed uh, the uh, talk tonight. Very, very informative, very interesting. Uh, okay, it's uh, the SS uh, Great Britain, which is down in Bristol. Uh, I visited it twice and took a lot of photographs, so I've ha had a great time going through them this last few days. And uh, I'm all ready to get in a plane, go back to Bristol and use my ticket, which lasts for a year, just to get another wee chance to see around it. But a fascinating ship and a fascinating story. So uh, that's basically as yeah. much as I want to say at the moment. That's, you know. No, that's great. And could we just use one minute of your time to, to comment on um, Thomas Andrews? Because you're a Thomas Andrews ophile, if that's possible to say. <laughs> Well, I was actually very impressed with uh, what uh, Kemp was saying, uh, because that was something that I had looked at and I could see quite clearly uh, his uh, passion for safety. And I think there's one little incident which is uh, really overlooked in the biography where somebody has been dismissed. They're making an appeal and uh, he is quite firm. He will not have this person back because he's putting other people's lives at risk. And uh, that, again, just given the whole knowledge of the way the employers would be, um, I think it, it would be quite important. I mean, the Andrew's family in Cumbert, they put a lot of money back into the community, built houses, they had libraries, schools, uh, the Andrew's Memorial Hall, again, uh, it would have been a memorial to Thomas and something that had to be useful. So it would have been somewhere where you would have entertainment, dances, uh, there was cinema, um, they used the hall as a cinema, uh, billiard room, there was, uh, uh, I think, a bowling green outside for you know out outdoor exercise. So again, entirely typical of that family, very much committed to their community, very much committed to the welfare of people. So I'm not one bit surprised. I mean, I, and I, I liked the fact that you did pick up on that. So thank you very much for highlighting yeah. that. Thanks, Sandra, and we'll see folks in, uh, on the 25th. Um, and, uh, and in closing, is there anyone else on the call who just wants to come online and make a, a comment before we um, say our final goodbyes? I just uh, uh, would like to say, uh, first of all, yes, um, I am... Um, this, there, what my question is, did White Star Line have an executive chef back then? Because, the reason why I raise this is because a lot of the the, the courses of the meals that they served were shared in other ships, and including the uh, launch day. If you were invited on uh, to the uh, Belfast Hotel, they even had some of the same dishes there. There seemed to be a common theme among this, so it kind of alluded to that. There must, there must have been an executive chef. Does so, David, you, it's it's great that you have a foodie question. You're making us hungry. Tad yeah, well, or Kent, yeah. are you aware of anything or anyone? Pat or can can is that something you're or mark is that i've never seen um a reference doesn't mean there isn't one out there mark may actually have uh something in some of the archives that he's gone through um clearly they had a department uh that handled these sorts of things and they also had you know uh executive chefs that were on each ship, you know, the best were promoted to the, the crack yes. liners. Um, and then of course on Olympic and Titanic, you had the special staff for the a la carte restaurant that was run mm -hmm. by uh, Gotti and the, um, he used to run the, I think it was the Odinino's Imperial restaurant in London. Um, so yeah, they, they would select the best people, the most knowledgeable people. They certainly had a coordinated um, a coordinated department throughout the line on it, but I, I've never heard of an executive chef that ran the department, not personally. Okay, thank you. So, look, should we call it quits? And the uh, the reason why I think that we we were so comfortable with extending our time there, Kent and Tad, was because look, we've had access to to you guys, and initially we've had three and now two. But you deserve that extra time because we were getting an, a lot of extra um, value there in terms of the answers to all of our questions. So, thank you officially. Um, just to let you know that after our meeting, we normally kind of hang on and go into a more casual and informal mode. And you are so welcome just to stay and listen and join in if you wish. But you also get the opportunity if you've been enticed by the hunger pangs for um, David Kaplan <laughs> bringing up food. You're also welcome to just to lead the meeting as well. But just to let you know that this is kind of, I suppose, the official ending of the, the, the your part of it. And like, stay on. 
No, you're very welcome. Um, and to confirm that you will be invited again. So thank you for accepting the challenge for another time. Well, well thank so, you all. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh, and I'll be in touch just to facilitate the, the video recording for you guys as well. So, and look, thanks everybody for, for, for coming tonight. Um, and I'm sure the other folks who weren't able to make it tonight will, will be able to view the, the video.